event between UCD and Cork on Wednesday and then um, Cork again on Friday. We have another um, program from there. Uh, but today I'm delighted that we have got, we've got two items, I suppose. Firstly, we have Peter Cody, who is assistant professor here in the um, School of Architecture um, Planning and Environmental Policy, who has for a, a, a long time been running the first year um, program here, and um, but also a very experienced teacher in lots of other parts of the program, and of course, practitioner with Boyd Cody, and also a graduate of the RMIT uh, program uh, with a PhD in architecture um, by practice. Uh, and Peter is going to talk to us today about a couple of current pre preoccupations, right? Projects that are on his desk at the moment, and then we'll have time. So then after that, we're going to go to hand over um, to um, Alana for a part of the uh, one of the Common Ground uh, series. This will be uh, a conversation with Roisin Perkis and Jack O'Hagan, both of them UCD students who are going to talk about their experiences with EASA, which is a, an organization that will be known to many students of architecture. Um, so, um, but first we'll go to Peter. And Peter, um, we'll hand over to you. Look forward to hearing about it. Thanks, Hugh. Um, so I was just going to talk about, I mean, it's very uh, sort of casual in a way, uh, I mean, two projects that are currently um, uh, working on, on uh, so they're on my desk, so to speak. Uh, amongst other things, um, uh, uh, they're both um, they're both houses, and they're both uh, currently at one is at tender stage, one's completed, one's about to go to site. So they've been through a kind of process of development, and they they uh, I guess will be built in the next year or so. Um, they're actually the two projects in the foreground on the, on the uh, table here. Um, I guess one reason for looking at them is they're 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 quite different. One is very much driven by its context. And in a way, almost every decision about the house is prescribed by its context. And the other is um, a, a quite a, a autonomous construction, really. Um, um, and uh, it's a sort of off-the-shelf house, I describe it in a way, but a lot of it maybe is to do with the quality of the resolution and the detail within the constraints of uh, the budget. So um, the first house is in South Dublin. and. <clears throat> Um, I guess it's in a quite a unique site. It's, it has an existing house, which is um, defined by the blue outline there, which is sort of mid 19th century Victorian house, which is not a protected structure. So it's been structurally damaged, so we can't retain it. And we were given a brief to remove it and to replace it with a new, uh, a new structure. Uh, I guess the unique thing about the site, it's, I mean, it's on a steep, sloping hill. It's surrounded by a very, uh, in close proximity by a number of other uh, large dwellings, um, which it overlooks. There is almost no access to the site except through a series of granite steps that lead directly onto the road. It rises about 10 meters to the actual level of the site itself. The existing house is a, is a three-story dwelling. Um, and so we were operating in these very kind of restrained uh, uh, conditions. So th this photograph here is the actual access there is to the site. And it's characterized, so it's really a, ro a rock outcrop. There's very low vegetation um, on, the, on the small garden in front of the existing dwelling. The house is also the existing house, which is the red outline here. It's a, re it's a retaining structure as well as a house because it retains the land behind it, which this house is built on. And here you can see the steps leading down to the road. So there's the added complication that, the, well, in, on the one hand, we have to take this building away, but it's a retaining the land. You can see it's a three story, it's almost eight or nine meters here, uh, the ground behind it. <clears throat> and it's sitting on a sort of rock uh, outcrop. Uh, the, the, the hatched um, red is the existing house. You can see this sort of rambling uh, villa. This is the house behind. Um, it's also, this is the house that's been proposed and as well as being retaining structure, it's sitting on the ground, but the ground itself that it sits on it has a retaining wall, which this is a neighboring house, <clears throat> which is two, the roof of the house 
So here's the, it's a two-story structure that faces into this courtyard. And the wall, which uh, is one of the, um, the planning kind of walls of the courtyard is retaining the ground on which this house is sit on, sits on. So besides, it's quite precarious in a way. It has a lot of responsibilities to adjacent structures. Um, and is, it's not just the case of trying to build a house. You're also trying to retain these uh, existing structural walls and the integrity of the site um, while we're trying to um, uh, build it. We had some experience, um, uh, we, we've just finished two projects uh, nearby and um, I guess some of the same issues arose in that construction because it was a landlocked site. Um, one of the things that was clear to us is a very slow process because there's enormous time issues involved when um, there's no access to the site. So in this case, the contractor had to build a conveyor belt about 40 meters long, I'd say, to the end of the site to extract all the material. Um, it's also the case, I guess, that um, the existing structure had to be stabilized. Um, and again, in the house we're looking at in terms of demolishing it, it can only be done part, um, uh, slowly, like partially, uh, like a part of the wall removed and then a new retaining structure built uh, while the rest of the structure is stabilized. Um, so it's, uh, I guess, the, character, the nature of these things is quite, uh, I guess, complex, complex to build. Yeah. I mean, again, uh, all the uh, vegetation on outside had to be bagged and everything has to be craned over the existing uh, buildings onto the road, which had to be closed. So Again, there's the added complication of these things because there's nowhere on the site to actually store anything. So there's no site space to actually move materials. So you're working with, in very restricted circumstances. It's that, that those two projects are nearing completion. This is actually one photograph partially of the, uh, one of those uh, structures. So I guess this becomes sort of like the defining thing in trying to uh, think about that house, where it's its responsibilities to its neighbours, um, issues about light. Um, because of the retaining structure, it had to be built in concrete because, well, it didn't have to, but we, the retaining wall um, and the, uh, had to be in concrete. And the infrastructure that had to be put in place or has to be put in place to do that means that economically, it's, it's the, the sort of logic is to continue with that form of construction. Um, and the other than this concerns about the neighbors' privacy, rights of light. We, 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 we went through many uh, sort of different configurations. Um, I guess in the beginning, there was always a courtyard to place at the back. Um, of course, the issue is being it's, it's single aspect, albeit south facing. It enjoys quite nice, uh, I mean, it has wonderful views at the upper level and it has uh, good light from the south, but in a deep plan, you get this sort of contrast between what that's uh, not very nice between uh, light and shade and also very poor ventilation. So we, we'd also try to work with a courtyard to the back or somehow to make a double aspect. And this proved very difficult with the neighbor above who was very concerned about noise, pollution. So then we opened it up to the east side. Um, this this, this it was fine in terms of the configuration of the house, but it, we, we couldn't really reconcile this with the lower floors with the, we have more accommodation for veterans where you have a lot of requirement for a perimeter wall um, and um, uh, kind of more complex internal planning. So I guess as we move through the various configurations, the house uh, begins to uh, adapt itself to surrounding conditions and also think about its, how, how it could be built and buildability. I mean, we've kept two and a half meters from the boundary wall on the east, uh, to, because we, we need to be able to uh, uh, build these walls, except where it's retaining here at the back, and forms a gable uh, condition with the neighboring uh, property on the west side. Originally, we had moved, extended out to be in line with the, uh, a neighbor, but the sense was that this was overbearing on their property. Um, and since they only took light at the back from this light well that was constructed, this courtyard, which was two stories deep, um, we decided to pull the line of the building back further. 
and we eroded a bit further this uh, courtyard that was on the east side. But this, this was the sort of uh, the penultimate configuration of the house. So it was quite open, supported by this large column to make this roof garden. It has its own terrace here and then this deep incision into the east side to bring light into the uh, back of the building. You enter, it's three stories, you enter under this, under the undercroft of this floor into this courtyard and the entrance is at the rear of the building. Um, and you, you, you rise at the back. So this is it in its context. Um, uh, it, it's set again, the, the height of the building is prescribed by the garden level of the house to the rear. Uh, you can just see here the courtyard um, on the west side, which it shares with this property. It also shares another retaining wall structure with this property here, and at the back here and on this side with this house. Um, so it's, uh, I guess, faceted to take uh, the benefit from the views, but to limit overlooking or and retain the privacy of the neighboring structures. This is still a bit too problematic on this side. Uh, there was a sense uh, that these people were being overlooked, uh, which needed to be addressed. Um, so we've uh, taken the plan back uh, on the upper level, reduced the courtyard. These are probably the final uh, sort of rough drawings um, uh, of the proposal that's going to tender. Um, so it's, I, I, I guess you have these faceted uh, walls, um, the, the glazing that were on these two sides have been removed, really these bedrooms open internally, again, to ensure the privacy of the neighboring buildings, both from uh, overlooking and also uh, from noise. This was a, the, so this is the house that, I mean, is going to to tender essentially or we're working on from the tender joints. So it's a, a three story structure. Um, basically you're working or cutting into the rock. Uh, so we're taking advantage of the, the existing house which is the blue outline, has this lower floor which is the entrance floor. Um, you, you entered along the side here in, into a, a hallway at the back. We're entering under the house, uh, under the undercroft of the first floor uh, into a hallway. There's some further uh, um, removal of rock required here, our excavation, and and then you rise from this level up to the uh, bedroom level. Um, it's on the next floor, we see them in context. So the the bedrooms are a uh, above. They have some views, but they're uh, restricted. Um, you're in very close proximity to the neighbouring buildings, so this is the kind of concern. And um, also the fragility of these retaining walls, which are quite old along here. There are these stone walls, which it's very difficult to, to assess their stability or otherwise. So although the original house came to this point, we've moved away. Uh, we do have a wall right on uh, sharing with their, uh, sorry, let's go back to the last one, uh, uh, garden, but, um, you can come from the lower floor uh, under this, up the stairs onto this terrace. Uh, you can wander around the house, come up the stairs here to the next floor. So on the first floor, you have these bedrooms that really, the main bit, open onto this south facing terrace. So they have their own sort of private space and space set between them. They're defined by these structural concrete walls, which are supporting the levels above and the roof. And all the services are essentially driven to the back. Uh, in the darkest part of the house against the retaining wall. Uh, so you arrive from the level above here, there's a stairs up to the floor above and uh, you can access the bedrooms. Inside there is this folding other wall, which is in timber, which is lining out the interior and it kind of shifts and changes to make these ancillary accommodation in the bathrooms and um, so that you have the main primary structural walls, these thin timber partition walls and then the glazing sections, which are the sort of three component elements that make up the uh, construction. Uh, so the, the other line is the line of the roof. This is the line of the terrace uh, above. So th there's no real garden. I mean, this is planted out uh, again to give privacy to the house below. Um, uh, so on the upper level, 
and again, just to see it in its uh, context. Um, there's a large tower, so the, the, the living space is pulled back. As we said, we pull this line back to not uh, uh, impose or impinge too much on this house. Um, uh, we, we, I mean, we're above the house, this house at this stage, and we were above its roof. Um, but it has a large terrace, south facing terrace, which allows all these rooms, the living space of the house, the kitchen, the dining, and the living room, to have this south facing view. But the overhang of the roof means that it's still shaded and it's double aspect, so it, it still obtains light from the back from the east. Um, so those rooms have this view out over uh, the bay. So they're very much orientated to that space, but they, um, although they're in very close proximity to the other buildings, um, by the siding of the house and the kind of facets, there's no potential to overlook anyone. So even a relatively small amount of planting here means there's no sight line available into this courtyard, you're looking onto the roof of the house. And similarly, uh, in the neighboring property, even at the closest point, uh, we have the screen placed on top of the existing wall. When you look down, you, can't, you can see the roof, but you can never see below uh, this line uh, into the uh, courtyard of the uh, neighboring house. So I guess the, the house has gone through these various uh, configurations, largely driven by site, thinking about its buildability and construction, uh, the fact that it has to be a retaining structure and how light and uh, privacy are retained. And um, I uh, also have about literally about how it can be built or like in the demolishing the existing house where the material can go in the first instance and how we can access the site to pour the structural walls and to maintain the building process um, uh, during the course of the construction works which is what uh, we are largely dealing with at the moment. Um, the second has so the second structure is very different. Um, this is a little uh, barn, uh, two bar, well, it's, it's, it's near where I, my own house. Uh, it's a little stone barn and then behind it, probably late, built later in probably the early part of the 20th century, this little uh, metal shed, which you're all very familiar with in the la Irish landscape. Uh, it becomes a sort of a, a, a I mean, a, a thought about the, the, the house. Um, I mean, I think it's very, um, I, I always love this. Um, one thing, the proximity of these two and their kind of, simple kind of tectonic expression. And um, uh, I guess something you find very frequently in Irish landscape the, the, um, is responding to very functional things with the ramp to, the, uh, to give access to the stone um, structure and, and then this light um, metal assembly behind. So uh, we started off, it was quite a big structure in the beginning, but we also had this idea that it would be like a shed. Um, and the, 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 we had a very low budget, but quite an ambitious client in terms of the accommodation. They had a, a young family and they wanted to, uh, to, to, to they, they were living in a current house, which was this little, um, there's a little cottage, which was, it dates, it appears to date from the 17th century. It's a fisherman's cottage. Uh, it would have had a plot of land down to the river Nanny. Uh, the house has been extended many, like, uh, um, on the side and to the rear, we, we were proposing to take away all those extensions and just leave a small little uh, two room cottage which was about 30 square meters. And we were building this um, structure which made two volumes with a kind of connecting courtyard or, or uh, well, there's a connecting building with this entrance courtyard uh, to the rear of it. And the, uh, there might be another model. Here. The house is, um, uh, the volume was uh, one volume related to the college and made a courtyard between it. You, you passed underneath it. And the second volume was really orientated to, the, to what is now a garden, but it would have been originally a plot of land for, for growing uh, vegetables, which led down to the river. It was a, instead of a fisherman's cottage, this would be their right of access to the river that would have approached the cottage from, this, uh, from the ground. Um, so, um, Again, if the house goes through several configurations, mainly driven by cost. Um, I think this is the very first uh, drawing, quite different now, but it quickly became about these two volumes. It did have a workshop, a kind of large workshop in it, which took up one of, most of one of the volumes. They were all single story. Um, and then we started to use the space above. 
um, uh, always considered as kind of a portal frame metal structure, uh, uh, and then clad in, in a possibly in a well originally in a rain screen. Um, the project below here is where we went to tender, um, but so it would be in this configuration. Again, you passed in underneath the from the courtyard underneath the building to this second courtyard, where you, where the link building connected them, um, and. Uh, then the, the, the sort of the living accommodation was in the second volume, which is south facing to the garden. Uh, again, this was um, just for economic reasons, we had to res uh, restrict the proposal. So we're going to build the, the, uh, the larger of the two volumes. It's anticipated that we might build this later, the second volume. So we, we, we kept the connecting piece, we re altered the old, or changed the configuration internally. You move the bedroom accommodation, which was in this block, into the second block. So you simplify the plan. There's essentially a, all the services and the bedrooms are in one half of the plan, this here, and then there's a large living space uh, in the second half. And then outside, actually, it's not shown in the drawing, but there's a terrace, which is the same dimension as the living room. Um, so basically, it's a third, a third, and a third. So unlike the other house, this house is on a grid. <clears throat> it's uh, 10 by 12. This is it's built using a, um, so it has a, a, a primary portal frame structure, but it's, it's clad in a, an insulated um, panel. I mean, it's a very cheap uh, construction. It's used, so the panel is a KW1000, um, which is a Kingspan insulated panel, the sort of thing you might see in an industrial estate. Um, and we, uh, I think I have some drawings earlier, but you can see it's just, the services are here with the stairs up, uh, to the medicine, which links to the bedrooms. And then the link building, where it had a link before, was comes down the entrance. This can be altered later if we build a second block. Uh, and it leads into the, um, the living space. So these are sections. You see there's a large volume, um, the bedrooms above. So, and then the uh, medicine, which uh, links the two spaces. Um, when I say it was off the shelf house, it's, I mean, it uses this Kingsman insulation panels. It's also, they're all one meter long panels, but they're full height, they're six and a half meters. Uh, there's one type of window, one type of door, or in these two screens, these glazed screens. Uh, similarly, internally, there's one standard, sort of standard door. So it's, it's, it's sort of made with all these kind of components, um, which are kind of iterative and repeated. So to reduce the cost, a lot of the, Consideration and it's just about the detail, really, about these windows and doors, uh, the gutters, the things, small things that you can control, uh, maybe to control the aesthetic of the building. But it is, it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a kind of bog standard insulated panel. It's, it's the only panel on the market that you can use on both the roof and the wall. So it's one. That's the reason we chose it, and it, it's compliant with the building regulations. So it's, I mean, we, it's an A1 rated house. So you can get a very high level of insulation. So basically you have a primary structure and then these purlins and then these one meter panels which are uh, fixed up. Um, and again, it's these things which we control, the, we can control the flashing. So it's, 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 it's that where you have a bit more leeway about um, um, uh, designing the sort of details of it and <coughs> considering about how it can put together. So we're, the, the house uh, uh, has a set of standard doors and windows. Inside then it has uh, this insulated, external envelope and then in, internally up to the door height uh, it's lined in plywood and then the plywood is on the floor of the bedrooms and over the mezzanine and the walls up to the side and then ev everything above that is a um, corrugated metal sheeting like a single ply corrugated metal sort of galvanized metal um, you can see it here sort of wheelie tin you might probably would have called it um, so it's, uh, I guess, as I said, primarily trying to think about the material inside, which is very simple. It's applied to everything, the plywood, the kitchen's made out of plywood, all the floors are, other than the living room where it's concrete. Um, and uh, those details around the windows uh, has, on, I mean, there's the pragmatic thing about cold bridging that, but just using the plywood linings um, to uh, do a bit of finishing of those windows uh, internally and to lend a sort of quality to the building from very simple uh, uh, details of construction. But they, they also do a lot of things in the sense they hide, uh, they allow for the uh, 
taping and air tightness um, and um, give some uh, leeway for controlling those things internally. So uh, there's a lot of, I guess, thought goes into these uh, and in rationalizing them so that they're all fairly straightforward and repeated. So there's the same details that are applied everywhere to the house, which is part of that trying to achieve its economy in terms of building is that a lot of the detailing is repetitious. Um, um, and so there's, it can be um, approached quite logically and resolve um, uh, logically as all these junctions are, are, are resolved, which uh, on one hand lends equality, but um, um, obviously make, in terms of buildability and construction and the speed at which that can be done um, is, is really what we're trying to achieve. So I guess the final slide. So I was, um, so they're the last, so they're just two, I said they're the two uh, projects amongst others that um, I'm currently uh, working on, uh, quite different uh, issues, um, I guess, uh, involved in them, but uh, they all come with their own sort of challenges. And um, uh, in, in, in a way, uh, even in that house, which um, I'm actually growing increasingly fond of, but in a way from the outset when you feel that, that there's not that there's a lot of constraints in a way on terms of costs and uh, limitations and but there's there's um a, uh, something very in a way quite interesting emerges on the other side of that as well in in trying to work within the constraints of it um equally the other has the constraints are maybe more evident from the beginning in terms of the site and um and the, the very restricted nature of the site um, which presents the, the challenges in terms of the buildability and construction of the building. So I'll, I'll uh, finish there. So I think this might have a lot, a lot of time. Expertly, expertly, adeptly. Um, thank you, Peter. Um, a really um, very rich and uh, interesting pair of projects. And um, we have, I think, about 10 minutes or so to grab some questions. Uh, if anybody does have questions or comments they might want to make to Peter, easiest thing is probably put them in the chat and then I'll either maybe call on you or just um, summarize. But Peter, I suppose one thing that was on my mind and in a way you touched on it there in the end was, I, I suppose I was trying to think about the common thread that binds the two projects together because on the on the face of it, they're quite different in terms of what the sort of determining um, forces at work on the one hand. Well, I suppose it is the fact that both are working in very constrained circumstance, one of them economic, the other to do with the site. Maybe you seem to be intimating that that's the thing that they have in common and that they're sort of driven by those. They're driven. Uh, <clears throat> mm -hmm. I suppose, yeah, finding the... Um, it, uh, I guess they're kind of unique and unique in that the constraints are very uh, like all encompassing. You know, like they're 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 very specific and and therefore, uh, like you kind of have to take them on as a challenge. Mm -hmm. And um, so, what feels like an impediment when you start, I suppose, ultimately actually can be quite fruitful when you actually get in. You know, when you start digging into it. But when the, I mean, I mean, like, I suppose. It, it was, it's Stravinsky that said, right, that art lives from constraints and dies from freedom. It, it, you need the, but, but is the constraint the generator for you then? I mean, the way you present both projects, it is in the sense of the first one, the site is the thing that generates the geometries, both in terms of the section constraints and particularly the thing to do with views, overlooking, that it's almost like a that the form is a resultant of just the sort of tracking of all of those mm -hmm. lines, let's say, of force and lines of view at work on the site. Um, so in that, but let's say then that became in turn a sort of preoccupation of the work, would that preoccupation then find another um, life in a subsequent project, do you think? You know, because I guess you discover certain things from working Frank, that then you want to explore further, presumably. Yeah, like I mean, I, I suppose the question, like if you if you didn't have those constraints, would you make some same similar decisions elsewhere? I mean, possibly. Yeah. I, I, although I think that the pleasure of something comes when you resolve something. Hmm. So, like uh, you know, when something, 
like a lot is responding to the functional requirement, you know, the, the, you could call them, say, the functional or demands of the site. And so at some point, you're also making judgments. So it's, there's a balance that's struck between those things. So in terms of form and the resultant form, but I mean, I would say you're still casting an eye on it. And, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's an aesthetic judgment as well. So, um, I mean, that would be the case in the other project with a matter of detail as well, that, uh, you know, there's, there's an eye for the detail of it. But um, I, I mean, I would say even more in the second project because the client's budget was very strict, you know, I mean, we tendered on a project and we just couldn't get to the price that we weren't hugely over the price, but they couldn't, it was just somewhat too much for them. So we, we had to change the project and eliminate one of the buildings. So I mean, what feels like quite a big move and move the accommodation into the other block. But uh, uh, actually, when you do it, the th in some ways, the thing becomes more edited, uh, m probably closer to what you had in mind in the first place. Uh, you know, when you're when um, you're trying to respond to the client's desire for uh, accommodation, and at the same time, but uh, mm -hmm. like in some in some respects, it it's uh, it, it's it's arriving at something closer to what you anticipated. Uh, driven by this um, external requirement, so um, I, I, I mean those things. I mean they're always kind of, uh, I think, quite interesting. And again, like you think you're giving something away, up, but actually, when you get into the alternative, it's also quite, you know, you get you sort of engage with it. I mean, maybe just a, I mean this may be off the mark, but just from looking at it and thinking about some of your earlier house projects particularly, it feels like you're more content to let contingency drive the project more in the sense of, I would have thought of in some of the early house projects, there's an interest in, let's say, ideal, ideal form or some sort of purity of form or space. And then it's kind of, it's conditioned by sight, but now it feels like sight or you know, um, let's say construction method actually push push it shapes the project more thoroughgoingly. Would that be fair? Or, or? Um, well, it's actually funny because you know, as you PhD, this subject comes up quite often. And um, but it actually, as you start to explain the projects, even the earlier ones, or some of the others, you re you realize like no project, particularly a house project in Ireland, like it's um, you're never in control, you know. You can, you can, there's the, the nature of construction industry. It's um, in, um, in the negotiation with the client, also in, in that nature, that kind of building. It's so, there's so many actors and players in it, and, and like they get become very extended for all sorts of reasons that you have to go, go with the wind, you know, you have to. It's, it's, I think, in the nature of them. So, whether it's presented alter, otherwise in the end is something different to really the, the reality of, of the realization of any of those things. And I suppose ultimately, as you build more, you become more um, uh, adept at, and probably more comfortable in that system. You know, I mean, I quite like, I, most of the decisions in our parties are made on site, quite large, significant ones about, you know, changing things quite dramatically. Um, and, it, you know, it's bad practice in some ways, but it's, the reality of making and um, it, like it's a side, you know, it's very much uh, you're you're doing it as it's been done. It's uh, quite significant changes and things happen and change you are made. And whereas before, I would definitely say yes. When you're when as a younger architect, very wary of all those things. I guess now would be more comfortable, yeah. and not certainly more open to it and not phased by it. And uh, uh, if you see if I see something that changes or if somebody uh, I mean quite often it can be something that contractor might introduce as in they can build something in another way and it's mm. why not do this and that so, the one on that incredibly constrained site the first one like to anticipate how that would be built how that would actually work out on site would be very difficult like, yeah well we're doing for this one we're doing on this one I'm doing the most construction management plan the demolition plan but actually in the first instance it was a fortuitous thing that we we started one of those projects and the house next door went for sale and the people so this could never be foreseen in the project 
but the mm -hmm. people next door, uh, it, we, the, we ultimately became the architects for their project as well, but they gave us access to their site because they didn't move into the house. Mm -hmm. And that made the building of the first one, it, it allowed us to do certain things for them, yeah. uh, anticipate things in their project, but it also meant that uh, uh, a huge number of constraints that would have been in the pr first project were certainly um, uh, accommodated by their kind of generosity in a way of giving the site for the duration of the works. So it just was kind of very fortuitous that this happened. But, but it, changed. it hardly becomes something you can build into your modus operandi. <laughs> no, I mean... Always no, client next door, yeah. <laughs> it's not going to uh, facilitate you. But in the last three projects that I've constructed, we've had to demolish a neighbor's, part of a neighbor's house to build them. Oh. So you, you realize you're into a lot of negotiation. And the only reason you can do that is because you're going to put something back that's better. <laughs> And you have to persuade people that, that would be the case, and you're interrupting their lives and things. So it's all there's a lot of, uh, and the nature of these things is they go on for you know, they go on for quite a length of time, and there's a lot of um, disruption, and it's not an easy thing for people to live with. So it's, uh, I mean, I suppose part of that work is you, know, you just have to be involved in that and um, negotiation between people, and uh, just being able to present a bigger picture in the end. Well, I mean, as I'm getting noises in my ear earpiece or whatever the equivalent is, um, that, that we we need to draw this section of this to a close. But uh, look, thank you very much, Peter. I mean, those are, I, again, I, I would sort of think of them as expert pieces of negotiation of all kinds, spatial negotiation, construction negotiation, views, light, everything is kind of being navigated and negotiated in both of these projects and material cost. So kind of, I suppose, ab object lessons in how it is that those things can be managed. Um, so thank you very much, Peter. Um, as I say, that recording will be coming up online um, probably by the end of today or tomorrow. Uh, I'm now going to hand over for the second part of today's show to Alana um, and for Common Ground. Um, and so I will just do that. So over to you, Alana. Great stuff. Thanks very much, Hugh. And as well, Peter, thanks for the presentation on the two current projects on your desk. Um, it was really interesting to see. So uh, we're back on Common Ground, um, the student segment of the current Zoom cast. Uh, I host the segment. My name is Alon Mountain. It's actually, it's great to be on the UCD. Um, it's great to be hosting the UCD uh, segment of, of Common Ground because it's all about creating a dialogue between the architecture schools and I'm actually on the MARC program in TU Dublin in Dublin School of Architecture in Bolton Street. Uh, so that's really good that we're creating a dialogue. Today on Common Ground, it's, it's so appropriate. It's great to have UCD uh, graduates Jack O'Hagan and Roisin Perkis on the on the segment and you're going to be talking about your experience with YASA so the European Architecture Students Assembly and um, again I I'm really looking forward to what you have to say um, I'm, I'm being we're at the time we're at I think I'm going to hand over the virtual microphone to you at Roisin and Jack so take it away. Uh, hey how's it going? Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Yeah, and um, I'm not going to go into full screen mode this time. Um, yeah. Just going to keep For it like. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and um, so yeah, so this is. I'm Jack. I'm the NC of EASA Ireland. Um, so NC is like the national contact. It's called, and there's they're pretty much the team captain of um, each country in Europe has a EASA organization. Um, yeah, I'm NC along with Bia, who's from. DIT or T, whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I don't know what yeah. Roshan talked about during that because I missed a lot of it. But um, yeah, EASA is the European Active Student Assembly. And the, the main output of EASA is the annual two week long summer school where workshops, lectures, seminars uh, dissect the central team, which the country chooses uh, for that specific assembly. And EASA is a it's an alternative education system where student to student lear learning method is applied. Uh, the summer assembly does not oppose the academia, but is a platform for 500, 600 architecture students every summer 
to question architecture, experiment and play with space. Um, yeah, so the event, it moves every year to different locations. Um, so this is where it's been since its beginning in 1981. Um, and every year there's two events. So IASA is the main summer school. Um, and then there's the, um, a separate event in autumn, which is how we organize where it's going to go next. And then there's been knockoff events like uh, NASA, which is the um, Indian summer school event, and then CLEA, which is in Central and South America. And then uh, Dosi by Dosi is kind of a knockoff event coming from that. Um, yeah, it all began in Liverpool in 1981 when a group of students um, were kind of fed up with the current teaching system and they wanted to try something new. And um, so it was organized as a one time gathering where students would meet and rethink the architectural education um, and engage in that certain place. Um, having the city as a provocation, um, they organized workshops to practice architecture. Um, and then throughout the years, the asset has moved and it's come to Ireland actually in Letter Frack. Uh, this is the furniture school down there where IASA was held under the theme of um, adaption. Um, and yeah, they were living down there. There was uh, different workshops that happened and one workshop pavilion is still down there today where I think the kindergarten actually uses it as a reading space in the backyard. So um, it's still alive and well down there. Uh, they lived in a circus tent similar to what happened last year. Um, yeah, and it rained the whole two weeks. Um, and this is what 500 architect students looks like. This was in Croatia, in uh, Rijeka in 2019. Um, yeah, and like, so during IASA, you, there's different workshops, obviously. There's different types of workshops you can attend. Um, there's construction workshops. There's more performative workshops. Um, there's workshops that kind of are more similar to the current education system where we sketch, design, make scale models, and then finally construct a one-to-one -one version of that pavilion. Um, so there's lots of hard, like working one-to-one, -one, constructing the pieces, uh, learning new tools, which many architecture students actually don't know how to use. So it's very exciting to everyone gets their hands dirty and gets involved. Um, there's some workshops which have like been awarded prizes like this one, which was in Malta in, um, it was nominated for a Mies van der Rohe prize. Uh, it didn't win, but um, yeah, just some exciting things happen as like, at the outcomes of IASA. And then there's like new materials people test with. So this was a, um, these three guys actually, two of them at least have an architecture practice where they make these pavilions out of fabric, which they inflate and they host events within them. Um, so that's been an outcome of IASA. They, they tested this system in Fredericia in Denmark in 2017. And now they're still a practice working on these systems and doing great jobs. Um, yeah, a lot of Adiasa, there's like, uh, there's different zones that we take over. So there's usually the workshop zone where all construction happens. Um, and then the projects are then brought to their final place um, to inhabit whatever the theme of their workshop is. And then this is the workshop that I uh, tutored, which I will get back to in a few minutes. Um, yeah, so then throughout Adiasa, there's many different types of events. There's um, it's like a part of a more formal approach to education. Lectures are organized um, uh, as a tool of more theoretical exploration of the team. Um, and then hosting countries can organize events or initiatives, whatever they see fit to host. Um, but the most interesting thing about IASA is that it's, it's a, a flat hierarchy system. So there's, there's no like chairperson, there's no real team organizing it. It's student to student learning. Um, so IASA does not exist as a legitimate international body. Um, it's just solely based on trust, which is passed on every year. Um, yeah. And then during IASA, there's many different events that happen. Like this was at Switzerland last year where we, um, as a bond like sharing system we discussed what could have what like what we learned from that IASA and what could be implemented in the next ones taking experiences from newcomers and people who've been there many times 
um, yeah, and then during EASA, so you do everything together, you eat together, um, different countries share the loads, so the organizing team isn't just um, doing everything. So different countries can help uh, feed everyone and things like that. And then there's a bar which happens every year um, where we talk and everything. And then the accommodation, uh, everyone sleeps together usually, that's the, the main goal. So in this is in Croatia in 2018, where we all slept in a unused warehouse um, made of these scaffolding bunk beds. Um, yeah, that was stuffy, uh, but it was fun. And then last year was in the big circus tent in Switzerland. But unfortunately last year, the plan changed very close to the event. So the tutors were put up in a school um, at the top and then the participants were in this circus tent on the bottom of the hill. So there's a bit of a split there that happened last year. Um, yeah, and then if you wanna know more, check out the Yasa Network website page, which is um, organized by, it's a shared load between different people across the, the, the community, where we try to share everything what happens with Yasa. Um, and then you can obviously check out all of EASA Ireland stuff. Um, yeah, this is our Facebook and Instagram page. It's the QR code for our Instagram page if you want to give us a follow. We try to share everything. Um, we are still unsure what the, what's happening next year with EASA. The, the plan for last summer 2020 was it was supposed to be in Estonia, in Valga. But because of Corona, it all kind of got changed about. Um, and then next year is supposed to be in Serbia but we're unsure if that's going to happen. So if that doesn't happen, we're going to really try this year to organize a um, uh, national gathering event in Ireland somewhere, just to get like kind of get the ball rolling of, I guess, an outcome of this current where we're trying to all connect each other. So I think we could mm -hmm. definitely host a, a gathering for everyone to come together and maybe get some workshops organized uh, somewhere in Ireland. Um, yeah, that's, so that's EASA. And then I've also um, like to delve into more of a workshop which I hosted in 2018 or 2019 in Switzerland. Um, it was called Building Barbagazi. It was, we, I organized it along with three friends. So this is Joe, Polly and Rory. And um, yeah, we, we created this kit of parts which we were gonna use to define characters um, which we would, get out of getting stories and myths from the locals and create these architectural structures um, which would encapsulate these tales. Um, yeah, each character was to um, describe the story um, through a moving system which would inhabit a place and then go away. Um, so yeah, we were, we were largely focusing on the way that a local and a tourist understand and experience place. Um, so we were kind of trying to create these characters about these stories um, through these architectural figures, which we could then trace an alternative uh, route through the Alps and documenting these personal stories uh, through the rolling construction um, pieces. Um, yeah. And then, so I guess I can give a background of what happened before going to Yasa is where you, the country, uh, the, the hosting country picks a theme and this theme was tourist. And um, so you, in springtime, you can come together with friends and organize a, or apply for a workshop. So we applied for this workshop um, where we created a, a framework. We created a concept, created a timetable, a budget. And then we also imagined what we, these things could look like without ever actually going there which was exciting. So we kind of imagined this fishing thing on the lake and um, like a dance arena in a car park and a lumberjack character in the middle of a forest. None of these we actually did, but uh, it was, yeah, you kind of have to come up with these ideas beforehand. Um, yeah, and this was our concept. So in the ass, as you saw, I showed some examples of different workshops that can happen. Um, so we were trying to take the theoretical approach and a design and construction approach without spending so much time on the actual construction of the pieces. So we would 
and wanted to take these two ideas and make them into a live prototyping. And to do that, we, we went a week early and we constructed all the, the pieces, like the kit of parts. Um, so the participants could come and just get hands on and make these one-to-one uh, -one prototypes of what these characters could be. Um, so yeah, this is the kit of parts we designed. We were concentrating on um, like, um, we're, we're concentrating on like iconography with the pieces and like uh, ideas about the aesthetics and the, the structure which we could show like how we would how we would make these architectural structures portray uh, a story and um, so we made these special pieces we call them which are these shown here and um, which would be colorful and abstract and we could the participants could change these into whatever way they want but then they could also be structural if they needed to be so there's kind of a dual purpose of these uh, special pieces we call them um, and this was the system that we designed. Because we were concentrating on myths and stories, we wanted to take something from Ireland that we could introduce into the dialogue to begin with. So we designed this structural system about around the St. Bridges Cross, where it was just an overlapping system of using nuts and bolts, uh, where nothing's tied together permanently. Everything's dismantleable and uh, can be carried around. Um, so it's all just relying on each other member to stand. And then we could use these special pieces to either create more different shapes or to start creating abstract forms. Um, yeah, and then through, we, we had this like system which we would continue going through the whole IASA, which is where we'd explore places, uh, we would have dialogues with locals and tourists, and then we would design together, and then we would build, um, we would inhabit the structure, and then we could deconstruct it and bring it back to base camp. And then we could do the same thing again the next day. Um, so this is our, our, our like method for the two weeks of how we would design these structures. Um, so yes, yeah, so we had to realize it then. So we got to Switzerland and we got our hands dirty for the first week before anyone else arrived. And we sanded everything down and um, spray painted the pieces we needed. We would drill, we had to drill six holes in these pieces of timber. Uh, it was 200 of them. So that took a while. Um, and then at IASA, there is a workshop fair, um, which is the first day when everyone arrives, you, the uh, tutors of the proposed workshops uh, present their workshop and what they're gonna do for the two weeks. And then for the whole day, everyone can take over the hall and ask the tutors questions and try and, and then they put their names down the list and hopefully they get picked. So we had to like present this as kind of like a job fair of why you should join our workshop and what we're gonna do kind of thing. So then we had our participants and the first day we finished getting the kit of parts ready. Uh, we were sewing some fabric because we introduced fabric into the project. And then we began by prototyping some pieces um, and the first step was to make backpacks so we could actually travel with the pieces around um, the town. Um, and these were the first, the first creations we made um, how we could imagine this kit of parts being traveled around. Um, so I guess we kind of became characters in ourselves walking through the village and walking through the, the landscape. Um, and the first character we produced, we took part in the Swiss uh, National Day event where they had a parade to the town. So we made this uh, tourist angel, we called it, because in the town there was a, a teenager who worked for the tourist information center and she had a high-vis jacket and she was the tourist angel. So we were uh, encapsulating her in the parade. We also made this uh, stall where we could uh, invite locals and tourists to come and uh, tell us places to go see and tell us stories about them. Uh, kids could get involved to make uh, abstract characters that they imagined. And then with the little French we had, we could understand what the locals were telling us or trying to tell us. Um, and then we introduced this method that we had pre-designed that we was that was the beginning of the, the exploration and the dialogue and then we were to design the pieces and share the stories so we worked as teams and we um, shared the stories we came up with we would go to different towns and look for locations and then we would start designing the what the characters could look like 
using a scale version of the kit of parts, we could design or we could decide which pieces we would bring to the site to later use. Um, and to get to the sites, we would take any way we could because it was yeah quite a long walk with all these heavy pieces of timber. So we sometimes took the, the Alpine train or the buses um, around different towns. And then we would get to site and then this is when the, the build and construction would start, where we would work together to construct the um, characters. Um, yeah. And so these were the final characters that we produced, gathered from stories that we got. Um, we ended up getting nine characters, which is great. Over two weeks, we could reimagine these different characters, which would move around the whole landscape. We really got around. Um, and these were the, the final outcomes. So this is the princess um, who took over the lake setting. Uh, Jerome, which took over the the middle of the town um, the devils they were these mountains were called something about devils or the the locals imagined that the devils lived on top of the mountains so this was like a scene from the village here overlooking this valley across the way which then the devils overtook and um, this was robin and robin lived in the base camp at the start and then we carried him to the second camp camp two um, where he opened up and got colourful and became more at home up in the mountain. And then this was a, a pagan festival. We decided to use all the kit, the entire kit um, that we created to create this kind of dance circle, which we then, on the second to the last night, we had a big party in front of it, um, which is great fun. Um, yeah, it was like a, a worshipping of the sun party. Yeah, and then these were the participants. Um, yeah, uh, like in Iasa, like the countries aren't the most important thing. It's great that you share um, with everyone across Europe, but I just chose to add the countries here because you really get an idea of the different cultures that you'd never become aware of um, without coming here and just discussing like different ways of that architecture is taught in schools and then you can share knowledge. Um, it's a great, like platform to get to know people from all over, I guess. Uh, yeah, I guess that that's the final slide there. Yeah, gonna, there was just so much in that. Um, yeah, all again, all really interesting. And um, thanks for doing the presentations, uh, students, graduates, even it, it seems like a really good platform for young firms to even do a bit of kind of research and development as well and um, to try different things and then thrown into the mix you also have uh, your flow your folklore and your pagan parties which it just all, it all seems like a um a really good mix so um okay without further ado we're gonna go over to roshi and Perkis <laughs> to speak about the european architecture students assembly hi um so i'm kind of coming at easa from a participant's point of view um I uh, graduated from UCD in 2018 and um, I suppose it was actually Jack who initially um, introduced me to EASA and then again um, through colleagues of mine in uh, Spain while I was interning they convinced me that I really had to be a part of it and um, now I completely understand why. So um, yeah I should probably share my screen. Um, so I'd say it's like essential for making contacts and opportunity for yeah. work. Hopefully um, Jack will come back on and explain a bit more mm -hmm. um, how it works. But basically there are teams from um, all over Europe who um, come together um, for a big assembly once a year, two weeks, and um, run workshops, participate, collaborate, and um, come up with new ideas. So um, I joined the Irish team um, in 2019 and was fortunate enough to go to villar sur in um, the French speaking part of Switzerland. So here we are in the Swiss mountains. And um, this is where all 400 participants um, lived, slept, worked, um, and discussed 
for two weeks in the circus tent. And um, I suppose what I would like to show is the feeling of a participant at EASA and the importance that I think um, EASA has as part of um, an architect's education or a young architect in Europe now. Um, okay, <laughs> so maybe a view that we're not quite used to at the moment, but um, it's all to do with collaboration, getting together, discussing, and taking time, um, two weeks is a good chunk of time, to work together on an international level. And for a certain amount of time not being worried about the outcome. So um, it's a completely different type of education to what we're maybe formally used to in our institutions. But it's something that I think is really, really important to take this time to um, listen to each other, to discuss topics that are important to us as young architects, young professionals, young designers, and understand that they're our um, problems we're going to face, there are um, ideas and challenges that are going to come up all across Europe and that different cultures and different um, people deal with these situations in different ways and it's just an amazing opportunity to hear what other people have to say and not only develop your own ideas, share your own ideas and um, see where they can lead you but also listen to each other and you'll see that i'm not sharing photos of final projects here because um well hopefully jack will show photos of his final projects but for me the most the part that had the most impact were these in between times these moments where we displayed or we talked and um, whether that be one-to-one -one with another student from um, Croatia or Bosnia, Finland or Portugal, or whether that be in a group setting. Um, EASA allows for space, for experimentation. Um, nobody worries really how things are gonna come out, but that's the beauty of it, that you don't have to worry about a final presentation, um, a portfolio, or anything like that. It's it's really giving yourself time to um, to just try new things out and to make friends, to make contacts, and to question your own understanding of things. To question why we learn in a certain way, and um, how our institutions are run, the similarities across Europe, and the things that we do differently. And um, yeah, having this space, I think, is it's just it's invaluable for me going forward anyway i now completely understand the value in time and that creativity can very often be um born and ideas be born in these in between spaces they're not always in classrooms they can be in these outdoor classrooms or just uh these moments where everything seemed to be going wrong or standing in line for food or gathered around a campfire at night that um, yeah, some really amazing discussions can happen. And uh, from those discussions, some great projects can be born. So um, I was gonna quickly share with you the workshop that I was involved with, just so that other students can get a bit of an idea of the sort of workshops that go on. Um, my one was called BWOC, and it was all about creating emergency shelter um, from common scaffolding pieces. So we spent maybe a week, a week and a half designing um, a BWOC um, from these scaffolding pieces, trialing, testing, putting things together, and then um, carried it up the side of a mountain, um, assembled it up there, put it up, put it down. Um, we really had to think about weather conditions. So this is an emergency shelter that um, yeah, is designed to withstand uh, lightning or um, snow, wind, um, all those sort of situations in the Swiss Alps. And finally, um, I would like to, if we have time, quickly discuss 
uh, a project that I am continued to be involved in that is a direct outcome from discussions at IASA and this whole idea of um, international communication and collaboration. So um, this is Doce por Doce. It's a student architecture competition that is, oh well, it, yeah, it's run across Europe um, for 12 hours, participants across Europe, students um, work on a project. And the whole concept is kind of that if a unified body work for a very short period of time, um, you can come up with amazing solutions. They might be the beginning of solutions or they might be whole new ideas, but solutions to tackle contemporary issues or opportunities in our cities. Um, so yeah, th this is a uh, the idea behind Dose Por Dose, we've got, um, you've got 12 hours. Uh, the topic or the theme of the competition is always kept a secret. And then the morning of the competition, all the students simultaneously receive an email um, with all the information that's required. And 12 hours later, they submit their proposal. Um, like I said, this was born in EASA, but it has proven to be really successful. Um, and so much so that in, we've branched outside of Europe um, and I've had a competition running in Latin America and most recently India. Um, thousands of students have now worked on Dose Por Dose competitions. And um, also now hundreds of universities are getting involved. So um, there are embassies set up and also um, sponsorships. So uh, yeah, this is something that I really hope that I can uh, bring to Ireland a bit more. We have had Irish participants in the past and um, we were planning for a big competition in 2021, which, well, in 2020, which was kind of being pushed forward to 2021 for now. And these are some examples of some of the students work, 12 hour work, some of our winners over the last few series of Dose Por Dose. Um, when we were able to have physical jury meetings in different continents and some of our winners. So this is like a, it's a competition designed by students for students. So we understand the time pressures and that's why it's a 12 hour competition. And just to understand that if you really put your mind to it as a team that you can um, create some seriously good output in 12 hours and then as a collective of teams across Europe we can um, gather a serious body of work and then we always aim to create a traveling exhibition at the end of the winners which then goes around to all the universities that um, had students participating and yeah this is a developing um, competition where changing things every year, growing and uh, yeah, just bringing it all back to where it started, EASA, where um, this might have been one conversation a few years ago, but through a network of people who are happy to help each other out, who um, want to see each other succeed, like these, these sort of things are possible. And um, this is just one project but there are many, many other uh, projects that have been established or that are running so highly successfully from um, sparks and conversations that started maybe just in this two week period, but have continued for a really long time. And um, yeah, new uh, firms and it's, uh, it's really exciting to see. And unfortunately we didn't have a um, physical meeting this year with EASA, but uh, there was a lot of work done uh, behind the scenes and virtually, and we're hoping to run again next summer. And Roisin, does uh, Dossi for Dossi have like an online, uh, you know, website or a place where you can like view some of these 12 hour projects? Because I'm just curious to see like with how efficient 12 hours, you know, you have to work really efficiently. And I think that's probably something that oh, I would struggle with. And I'm sure a lot of architecture students struggle with working efficiently, you know, rather than spending hours on the tiniest details of 
a drawing or exactly or, or I should definitely you. share it I'll put it in the chat so we have a website and also the social media pages and mm -hmm. Instagram is like it works quite well through Instagram but um I think that is the beauty of it is that like on the morning of the competition there is such excitement and hype and we have done a lot of the kind of background work before handing it over so um mm -hmm. we prepare the necessary documents and the research so that um not too much time is sucked up by doing research yeah. and then um students can just go for it and the whole countdown i think it it puts pressure but in such an exciting way and when you're working with a group of friends either if it's around your kitchen table or if you're in an embassy or if it's virtually at the moment then um it's like uh, something that you like you're really working for and mm -hmm. that you've got a whole extra project to add to your portfolio in the space of one day and mm -hmm. uh, yeah it's uh, it's been a really good success and great fun afterwards going for uh, going for a pint together and just celebrating your work and um i think that's the whole idea of behind all of it is like how students and young professionals can work together to produce more and mm -hmm. not always produce more but produce like physically more but produce things that they've actually spent time thinking about and um, and that's the point of IAS is that you get that break, you get that time to think without worrying about the final product. I think I think this is like a really important thing to broadcast to students as well, because I'd actually never heard of this uh, before we started talking about organizing the segment. <laughs> it's something I like really want to do. Um, like I, I think it's it's a really interesting sort of because uh, was it last week as well? Last Wednesday we had on uh, a PhD student uh, from Cork. I think it was in Cork at least. Uh, when, when Cork was hosting last Wednesday, and they they were essentially studying alternate forms of architectural education and this idea of rethinking how we actually, you know, learn about and understand architecture and you know fundamentally question what is architecture. So I think I think this is really interesting. Yeah, it's um, we uh, usually the participants can start applying to the team in springtime. Mm -hmm. um, but we obviously don't know what the platform is we're using next year, but hopefully we'd like to. Um, we'll share everything on Instagram of what we're going to do next year and what the team can look like and what the location might be if it's Serbia or it's Romania at home. And mm -hmm. um, so yeah, hopefully we can get some more people involved next year. Are there, are there costs associated with this or like because I, I think it's interesting how it's not like hierarchically um organized it's sort of almost um anarchically organized but are, are there costs is it like there's no fees or stuff or how does that work yeah there is a fee yeah so you every country pays for their uh, travel expenses to get there and then we have split up the, every country in europe is divided into different um like cost settings depending on what their background is so mm -hmm. ireland is in the highest um bracket so we i think it's i think it's 340 euro for the two weeks but that is just paying for food and accommodation and everything because there's no universities that are involved in this so it's all through the organizing country have to get the funding themselves through sponsorship and through our fees so it's uh, they also take two years out to organize it they they don't get a uh, a wage from this system it's just mm -hmm. out of the the good of its the need to keep it going yeah um so yeah that's the only fee that's involved yeah. pretty accessible though is there is there any um i suppose supports for like people who might not who, who that that fee might even be out of their grasp like is there any way because i know i i there are some i know it's kind of off topic but there's some blogs that i follow that are like you pay to read them but then you can also like choose to pay for somebody else's fee as well if you're um financially able to so like is there is there anything in place like that for people who can't actually afford Not to go currently unfortunately but this is something that we've had uh, we've started a dialogue about uh i guess a year ago now over a year ago which we hopefully take up again with different schools because mm -hmm. across europe some schools or some countries get their universities to pay for their fee um, an example is northern ireland Queens and UU, they pay for the participants to go, mm. um, which is just, it gets them so much more applications because some people don't want to take two weeks off in summer 
to pay for something that they like education system. Yeah. So it's great that there's some platforms there that can help with fees. So hopefully we can get, I don't know, we can't promise anything, but um, it's something that we want to uh, research more into for sure. Yeah. That's cool. cool. I think there's also an opportunity like um, we've been discussing more this year with the ASA Ireland team that, um, yeah, the word isn't quite out there enough in Ireland yet. And um, perhaps if we build a stronger team um, with more people involved, then we can um, run smaller workshops within Ireland. And like exactly what you guys are doing here with the cross uh, collaboration between schools in Ireland, mm -hmm. which is something I think was like definitely lacking in the past. And um, you're really filling that hole and hopefully can continue on because it's something that yeah i think it's part of the IASA mentality as well is bringing the schools of our country together yeah except uh, yes is doing uh, like obviously uh, on the european scale like bringing yeah, we're kind Europe of together. yeah yeah we're doing it on the smaller scale across yeah across but ireland. Something that we want to do we really want to get more participants from ireland because we really only get participants from ucd and dit currently it's really hard to branch out further. Um, so this is something we're battling with every year. Um, mm. So hopefully, we, if we can get a national gathering organized, then we can get as many people from everywhere just to come and see. But mm. it's even like the cultural exchange, like the dialogue that needs to happen. Like I only met students from DIT through the yeah, so, yeah. which I've never have done before. I, I imagine we, we've run a bit over time. Um, I um, I suppose I don't, I don't have any uh, further questions, but... Um, Steph, thanks for throwing all the links into the, firing the links into the um, chat within the call. Um, and yeah, thank you for those extremely clear presentations, um, Roisin and Jack, and telling us about all that is involved in EASA. So 